All right, everyone. On behalf of Vajrayana Institute, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Mathieu Ricard here to our centre. Mathieu, over the years, has become a great friend of our centre. He's appeared at four of our conferences now, very generously, given his very busy schedule. And he um, has now come to our centre for the first time. Mathieu has been a monk for many, many years. He's well known for, through his marvellous books. He's a philosopher, he's a scientist, a wonderful photographer, and a great humanitarian. He runs projects through Karuna Sechen to help people all through the Himalayan region, and he's also a very dear friend of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome him here. Thank you. Bad. It's very wonderful to visit this wonderful and very peaceful place. It sounds almost like in the countryside with all the parrots flying here and there. So but the be this beautiful morning, I think it's a good start to reflect together right on happiness. Yes. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so many subjects. <laughs> I don't know which one. So, so of course, um, it's a vast subject, and um, it was defined by many thinker, including His Honest the Dalai Lama, but beginning with Aristotle, as being the goals of goals. Um, Aristotle said that everything else we do is in view of um, achieving uh, something better in our life, some kind of well-being. Um, but that state of well-being, or the, used, the Greek also called it a demonia, kind of accomplishment, flourishing, uh, is a goal in itself and so of course uh, it depends very much what how we define it there might be many different levels of just like a sense of fulfillment in this life so that we don't have much regret as this life proceeds and especially at the end of this life when we look back that like a peasant uh, who has uh, done his best to plow the fields and grow the crops and of course there might be some hazards but from his or her side he has done whatever he could do so nothing to regret so it is a state of deep satisfaction so now of course from the Buddhist part it's already quite good to have this uh, sense of fulfillment and accomplishment uh, but uh, from the perspective of the whole part of freedom from suffering uh, that may just uh, not be quite enough so in a way uh, even though it is certainly better to have a fulfilled life and to engage in constructive activities and way of beings to transform oneself to better serve others all are excellent and noble purposes to give meaning to one's life from the perspective of the whole Buddhist scope of the Buddhist part uh, unless one has uprooted the the ignorance which is the misapprehension of reality uh, that is the deep causes of suffering and then and that will be a good step uh, but just merely uh, a limited step so the ultimate happiness is the true only happiness which in fact transcends the notion of happiness and non-happiness is enlightenment uh, so keeping that in mind 
uh, still uh, there are a lot of steps uh, there are states which are relatively free from um, what cause most of our misery and so those are worth contemplating and then we can indeed go deeper uh, to go at the very root of suffering and ignorance but say since uh, His Holiness the Lama often says uh, that the happiness is somehow the goal of life and that applies to everyone so of course not only to those who are engaged on the Buddhist path and that there are uh, human values that are crucial to have a good life meaningful life uh, which he calls secular values or secular ethics not just uh, as a way to as a reductionist point of view but more like uh, thinking of a universal uh, value that can be used by anyone uh, even those who are not engaged in the path of transformation uh, that uh, part of the of Buddhism offers so in the first step uh, it is um, useful to consider that level of happiness of just a healthy fulfillment uh, that we can achieve in this life and in ways which are use usable by anyone no matter what and that makes sense to that can make sense to anyone so for that uh, if uh, as Aristotle said happiness is the goal of goals which not everyone necessarily agrees and uh, I don't know how much this prevalent in other areas of the world but certainly in Paris there's a bunch of people who don't like Happy, don't care a damn for happiness not only that but they don't like it <laughs> and they they just don't want to to hear that concept they think it's uh, an imposition they think it's uh, unfair be because they are suffering and they want to make a whole philosophy around that <laughs> and they don't want to be um, have the burden of having to be happy so they think, no, oh, that's true. There's a lot of people saying that, writing about that. Uh, as I was mentioning yesterday in the workshop. Was there anybody yesterday in that workshop from here? A few people. Okay, so not too much repetition, but it's not a big deal, not a big problem if I say a few similar things. Uh, when I'd, I tried to write this uh, book on happiness, it was in fact in a way to um, defend uh, the work of His Holiness in the Heart of Happiness that was very well received by the general public uh, but that was um, considered what was attacked by those intellectuals and uh, so having that in mind I'm trying to clarify a little bit that to support His Holiness's thinking uh, from many perspectives and uh, I thought I made quite good arguments, but it seems didn't work, <laughs> uh, because uh, when the, some excerpts of the book were published in a measure uh, weekly, uh, they also gave uh, a column to one of those uh, who said, who entitled his column "The Dirty Works of Happiness," <laughs> saying that you know this is a very out of fashion idea, and. Um, and especially they felt it was an unfair imposition that to demand that everybody should be happy and otherwise we are kind of a failure so I think this comes from a misunderstanding because even someone who writes a book against happiness he's not a hope I don't think it's the case even of those French intellectuals they are not doing that with the idea to harm others they think they are setting it straight, they think they have a smart idea, uh, that they are clarifying the, the, a sort of uh, a, a view that they think to be valid. So in a way, they think they are about bringing a contribution. 
And when they say there's many more things important than happiness, like justice, uh, uh, contestation, and political activism, or creativity, or passions, what does that mean? It simply means that that's their way to find fulfillment in life. So in fact, uh, we are saying the same thing, but they're, they're stuck on this word happiness, thinking that it's a kind of perpetual euphoria, uh, you know, like we see those billboards, you know, use that washing powder, you'll be happy, or use that toothbrush, you'll be happy. So in that sense, they are quite right in denouncing this kind of, uh, what the use of happiness that is done in our modern world, but I think they miss the point in terms of uh, deep fulfillment. And so, possibly, uh, it is because of uh, uh, that kind of confusion around the very word happiness. And when I was researching that, at some point I was so confused in finding those incredibly varied definitions that I ended up writing two, two columns and putting all the definitions. And then I, I start matching them and I could find almost for every definition, it's just the opposite, also written by a very brilliant person from some time in the past or, or in our times. Some people were saying happiness is only the pure experience of the present moment. Another philosopher wrote it's only about embellishing the past and imagining a beautiful future, never in the moment. You could find every possible thing. Some people say it's like having a triumphant, strong ego. Some people is inner freedom from the self. So you could find almost everything. And then finally, I found this quote from Henry Bergson, who is a French philosopher, who said, all the great thinkers of humanity have left the word happiness in the vague so that they could define in their own terms. Of course, if that's the goal of goals, that doesn't help very much. <laughs> but, but strangely enough, there are, it's a very common to hear uh, philosopher and anyone, ordinary people, saying that you cannot give a definition of happiness because happiness is different for everyone. So again here, I think what they mean uh, is not that we cannot give a definition of, well -be of genuine happiness, but that everyone finds it uh, to different ways of accomplishment, of flourishing. So that's where the confusion lies. Uh, some find it through the pursuit of uh, ju social justice, some find it to serving others, some find it to uh, staying all their life alone in a hermitage, or, or being a doctor, or, or whatever. But that doesn't mean that happiness per se, uh, we cannot think what it is. Otherwise, uh, if it's really at the heart of our preoccupation, and I think it's probably true, that it is the goal of goals. Because no matter what we do, whether when we wake up in the morning, unless we are in complete state of despair, uh, we certainly expect from taking a cup of tea, from gathering together here, from taking a walk, from engaging in, a, in an activity, from, um, from human relations, from anything, that something uh, constructive or positive or f satisfactory will come out of it. If we were, who will en engage in a kind of part or in a tunnel if we knew that at the end it's 100% guaranteed that there will be nothing but suffering? That's where we fall in despair. That's where we question whether I should be alive or not. And uh, one of the <coughs> ones, w one of the things that um, inspired me to try to clarify that, among other things, is once I heard in Hong Kong a young person. We had a kind of meeting, a little bit like this, and got up. Uh, at the end of the talk, he was in his early 20s and he said, could you give me one reason why I should l continue to live? You know, it's difficult to answer that at the end of so-called a conference, but at the same time, you cannot not answer to something because you can see that it's to someone who's there to ask such a poignant question, and that's something very, very, very uh, serious in a way. So, if we didn't have 
the hope that whatever we do is going to bring something more than what we have now, or at least less suffering that we will not engage in. So that's it's quite clear. But if we don't therefore recognize what is genuine satisfaction or fulfillment, what is not, and then as it says in the Buddhist teachings, we might pursue happiness and yet turn our back to it. We might want to avoid suffering and that we seems we are running to it. And there's even a further image, we are running to it and sort of hitting on the sharp blade of the law of cause and effect. Meaning that we contradict our aspiration by the way we act and speak and think. That means we unwillingly build up the cause for suffering. So unless we clearly recognize what needs to be accomplished, what needs to be avoided to, uh, to f progress toward that fulfillment, then, and say, leave it in the vague, as Bergson said, or saying that everyone can de de define in their own terms, is a little bit like shooting arrows with a blindfold. We don't know. Sometimes we hit, we don't know why. Uh, we don't know where's the target. So we keep on hitting in the dark, uh, hit, shooting arrow in the dark. So it is. It seems quite uh, essential to have some kind of uh, inv investigation about what could be the nature of genuine happiness, and what, how, people who sort of say happiness cannot be found. How do they envision that happiness? What do they think it, it, it is so that they uh, affirm that it, it cannot be achieved? Never. Uh, so first of all, there are some definitions of happiness you find in, in Western philosophy uh, that uh, once they are, you, you define it like that, you, it's clear that it won't happen. One of them, I, I just forgot if it was Emmanuel Kant or Schopenhauer, one of those, who said that the happiness, true happiness, will be the complete fulfillment of all our desires. That means what we want the world to be, in quantity, quality, and duration. So if that is the case, yes, it's out of reach, because the universe is not a mail-order catalog for all our desires. <laughs> Even if there was such a catalog, there are six billion beings trying to use it in different ways. <laughs> so it will never be the image of our, of our wants and desires. So this way, if, it, if you make such a definition, then of course it's not happening. The other possibility is people who think that associate happiness only with pleasant feelings. An endless succession and of renewed pleasant sensation, physical sensation and mental sort of uh, pleasure. Well, that uh, sounds very much like a recipe for exhaustion, but not for deep satisfaction. And that is a very common confusion. Um, but if you look at the characteristics of both, uh, pleasant sensation and what we will define as happiness as a way of being. They are, they are not contradictory. Of course, pleasant sensation can contribute to well-being, but it can also undermine it depending how we experience it, with grasping or without grasping and so forth. But let's just examine what the do pleasant sensation are based upon. They are uh, very much depending upon outer circumstances which themselves are changing all the time. So, of time, place, people, situations, and so a certain combination will might give a birth to a pleasant experience. But those are changing all, uh, ephemeral. The sensation itself is eminently fluctuating. Uh, it can be very pleasurable for a while, then becomes neutral, sometimes aversive. That's the nature of things. Um, we can give many examples of that. Listening to a beautiful music that we like so much. Maybe we play two, three times. Still maybe okay. 
But if you had to hear it for 24 hours non-stop, it would be unbearable. And it is true for most of pleasurable sensation. They consume themselves like, uh, uh, like a candle. There's an element of, of tiredness involved in those. They change nature. Like a, you come near a, you have been, you, are, you, are, you have been walking in the in the forest or in the snow. It's raining or something, and then you come to a bonfire. What a delight! You're just there, wash, drying your clothes, warming your hands. But then after ten minutes, it gets very very hot, isn't it? You move back, so it's changing. So you can't. Uh, so in any way, it entirely depends on outer conditions. And our control of the outer condition is limited, is ephemeral, and often illusory. You know, we so-called have everything to be happy. That very uh, formulation, to have everything to be happy. That means if you don't have everything of that everything, you will stop being happy. And so that happens all the time. We lose health, we lose our job, we lose this, we lose that, and then things collapse. We, th we, we thought we were on top of the situation and things collapse. And also, pleasurable sensation is something that can be experienced at the cost of others' well-being. It's not something that radiates outside. Uh, it can be very selfish. So it's not associated with fundamental human qualities but it's really the field of sensation so now if we consider that well-being or happiness or fulfillment as not as a sensation but as a way of being so that's a different very different thing a way of being refers to a, a cluster of various qualities so of course, there are many that could contribute to that, but let's, if we just uh, consider the main ones, uh, that which are the opposite of those that usually cause torment, like selfishness and self excessive, uh, sen the exacerbated feeling of self-importance does cause sort of torment, so therefore openness to others, altruistic love, compassion will be one of those qualities. Uh, to be constantly the slave of our thoughts and emotions and so forth is a source of torment. So inner freedom will be a quality that contributes to well-being. Um, to be constantly disturbed by inner conflicts and, and not be at peace is a cause of torment. So likewise, inner peace, inner strength, a genuine sense of confidence, uh, will be uh, one of those qualities. Confidence in the sense that we can deal with whatever comes in our life. So here, if you think of the, a state of, of, uh, of being, a way of being like that, it's almost point by point the opposite of pleasure. Uh, the more you experience it, it's like a skill. The more you experience it, the more it, it gets clearer, deeper, more stable, kind of strong. It's like doing physical exercise or mastering something. So instead of the more you enjoy pleasure, it sort of escapes. Here, the more you experience it, the more it becomes uh, part of yourself. Instead of being eminently vulnerable to the change of outer circumstances, it gives you the, the base, the foundation or the resources to deal with those ever-changing circumstances in a, in a way that you are not uh, um, like um, you are not sort of unsettled by those so it gives inner strength and so it is something that will uh, translate by qualities that are perceived by others as uh, positive qualities benevolence, openness to others and so forth someone who is full of inner peace inner freedom, inner compassion will be generally someone with whom it feels very good to be with, who will spontaneously act in ways that are beneficial to others and to society. So it does radiate, radiates outside. Uh, like 
anyone and most of you have uh, have come near to uh, great teachers like His Holiness the Dalai Lama for most of all, uh, we can feel immediately how that goodness is something almost palpable and uh, how much we benefit merely from the fact of there being such a human being there and uh, just that sort of presence of due to these qualities is something that suits uh, that uh, uh, suits our own torments and is like a balm of, on our inner uh, uh, afflictions uh, that brings the best of ourselves at the surface so it has a positive effect on others and so so as you see it is very different so again it's nothing that and it's nothing wrong with pleasure there's nothing wrong in taking a hot shower when we are tired or anything but it but whether it contributes to happiness or undermine happiness depends entirely in the way we experience it if it's with craving or with selfishness will any of those mental poisons or toxins then pleasure will undermine happiness if it's just like enjoying the i don't know the beauty of things of nature uh, in the present moment without any grasping without attachment no realizing the illusory and empty nature of everything then it's, it's just like ornaments so it will not uh, be a, 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 a impediment to flourishing so but but in itself it has no intrinsic relation with uh, with, with genuine well-being so that's one uh, distinction that is important because the confusion is often made uh, yeah, when you see those you know, Saturday night show with everybody with big smile and they jump and all that, <laughs> and then this happy, 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 and then at the end they collapse completely exhausted. <laughs> so we might jump of euphoria, but we don't jump of happiness, isn't it? So, so that's one way, and then also, uh, well-being. There's a deeper aspect to the, this, those qualities. It is that um, well-being goes we it has to be somehow functional. By functional, it means something that is attuned to reality. Something that is at odd with reality will not work. That means it will bring torment in the end because we try to function in ways that are just completely conflicting with reality. So if we grasp things as being permanent, in the end we are going to suffer because things are not permanent and if we insist that they should be, this is mine, this has to be like that, this has to remain like this. So we are, when it's not happening, then we suffer. And so, and that's quite true with pleasures that they, with, they distort reality. Attachment, both attachment and repulsion, uh, when they are very strongly mixed with, with grasping, do immensely distort reality. Uh, as Ernest often says, when we have a strong attraction for something, it becomes 100% desirable, which is of course not the case, it's entirely our projection. And then the moment that things is not considered as desirable, it may, dis it may become 100% hateable or despicable. And again, it's a great deal of a projection of our mind. So that's not in harmony with reality. And that has to do with the fact that we do verify ourselves, we verify other objects, other persons, situations. By verifying, it we mean attributing some kind of autonomous intrinsic qualities to phenomena, including our, our stream of consciousness, building there's a self being like the core of it. And including the outer phenomena. If we think that a particular object that we perceive at the moment as attractive or pleasurable, that it belongs to that object, intrinsically, the way we perceive it, then, then we, it's not going to function. Uh, and we can show many ways that this cannot be the case. If that uh, attractive quality was really intrinsic to that object 
independently of you, then everyone should see it as attractive because that will be the quality of the thing, nothing to do with you, but it's of course not the case. So that doesn't make any sense. And uh, by the way, when you change your perception completely and revert it, you're still convinced that that, pe that thing is 100% bad or 100% good depending upon your state of mind. So that shows very much, but still we don't have enough you know, continuity to see that it's our projection. And uh, so, so, of course, there are characteristics to phenomena, but they all emerge through interconnections. Uh, they are not entirely, the way we perceive them is not completely determined until our consciousness interacts with those. So we could say that the interconnectedness of all phenomena, the relations, in terms of the way we are going to perceive the universe, is more like a, those relations are more like a potential. And when a particular type of consciousness, whether it's my consciousness now, a consciousness of another human being, or a consciousness of a very different being, like a, a bat for instance, sort of hits or interact with a particular set of, 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 of in, uh, interdependent factors, then some kind of thing crystallizes out of that, that, that appears to me as my, my perception, my universe, uh, a particular object endowed with some characteristics. It's a momentary crystallization of the state of my consciousness now with all that interconnected factors. But on its own, it has no intrinsic quality. It's a little bit like a rainbow. Like a rainbow appears, for that you need a curtain of rain, you need the sun uh, shining at a certain angle, you need an observer. Now, that rainbow, it seems very vivid. Uh, this, uh, it says in the teaching that we might think like a child that goes catching, the, try to catch the rainbow, or someone that thinks that he could catch the rainbow and wear it as a, as a, as a, as a garment. But does the rainbow as even a speck of autonomous existence? Simply remove one of these elements that is not the rainbow, by the way. The sun is not the rainbow, the rain is not the rainbow, you are not the rainbow. But just the sun is momentarily hidden. Then it's not that the rainbow is sort of diminished or it's a little bit less something. It's just gone. There's not an atom left of what, if we could say, N not even a bit of the existence of a rainbow is left. So it was only existing through interdependence. It has no existence on its own. But when it's there, of course, it's a phenomena. We can give it a name. We can attach a concept to it. We can relate to it in some way. Without, if we, if we understand its nature, attributing some intrinsic quality to it. But basically, although that's a clear example for everyone, uh, but it is the same, in fact, of all other phenomena. And in terms of the way we relate to phenomena, attributing quality of being intrinsically pleasant or unpleasant, well, there's no, it cannot, there's no such thing. If we take the example of a rose, uh, like uh, for a poet, he might write a beautiful a romantic poem about the rose. Uh, for a snail, it's a nice salad. <laughs> uh, for a, a whale, it's just maybe nothing. If it floats on the ocean, it's not very interesting. Um, and if you were, be if you were some kind of being at the l atomic level, it would just be a vast, almost empty space with a lot of particles moving here and there. Very not much of a rose. Uh, that's kind of a modern example of a, of an example that one finds in the, in the sutra, uh, where it says that uh, a beautiful woman is an object of desire for a worldly man, uh, is an object of uh, of temptation for for an hermit, and is a good meal for a tiger. <laughs> so very different perception. None of these is really 
what uh, intrinsically defined uh, a person. So once we know that, and then we don't verify uh, the the world, and then we don't dysfunction. So a state of well-being of of uh, of, of wisdom, because wisdom is of course a, a major component of of that well-being, is to distort less reality, or uh, ideally not at all. That means uh, full wisdom, which of course the more we go to full wisdom, the more we approach Buddhahood. Uh, but at least not the gross usual distortion that we ceaselessly uh, do. Taking things for permanent, assuming that there is a self, independent, autonomous self when there is none, and and all those um, uh, seeing things as source of happiness when they are not, and so all those like the four seals of the Buddha's teachings. So that's a, a very essential part of uh, or quality of that clusters of quality that bring genuine happiness. And in a way, when we speak of ignorance, it in Buddhist term it really means. Uh, the distortion of reality, misapprehension of reality. Ignorance here is not uh, that one is not smart. Actually, ignorance is quite smart to fool us. It is not just a lack of information. Uh, that ignorance that we speak, like unawareness, is not that simply we don't know the telephone directory by heart. It is really a misapprehension of reality. And so then, so that's the root cause of suffering, that the root cause of unhappiness. So obviously, if that's the root cause of, of unhappiness, it has not much to do with pleasure and displeasure. Now the antidote to that is not a more pleasurable experience, it's wisdom, to understand the nature of things as they are. So nothing to do with sensation, not even with emotions. It's a, it's a cognitive impediment to genuine happiness. But then out of that uh, ignorance will spring all the mental toxins which are, de which are de then linked with different kind of mental state and emotions. Uh, because once we start distorting reality, one of the first things that happen is this attraction and repulsion. Because when we begin verifying, then we consider that something is by all means desirable. This is in the sense that it, 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 it seems it's going to please that self that we also have verified as something autonomous. And then uh, we need to protect that self because we think that something might threaten it. And so then we have aversion for every, everything that might threaten it. So aversion and repulsion are sort of the first manifestation of that verification of self and the rest of the world. Out of that will come strong desire for what is uh, craving, for what is uh, meant to be desirable, repulsion for what is supposed to be threatening or undesirable, and then so that's the and then confusion because we think that's the nature of things. And then other different kind of toxins will will broach onto that, like envy. If we don't have something that we deem desirable that others have, or arrogance. If we just get puffed up because we think we have some quality, and then nobody else has them. So then, a kind of hesitation and or miserliness, all kinds of other mental toxins will creep in because of this initial. Uh, impulse of taking and rejecting. So then those are, are more on the what we call emotional or different mental state, not as fundamental as ignorance. And so then we need to treat them uh, differently. So that's why we use different types of antidotes, because those cause suffering in the end. And that's what we want to get rid of. So there are antidotes for those afflictive emotions and there are antidotes for the basic ignorance. So antidotes for the various uh, afflictive emotions, there are of many kinds. Uh, they might be one-to-one -one 
antidote. There might be fundamental antidote that can apply to all uh, afflictive mental states. So first, the specific antidotes uh, to that require that we um, we identify clearly the uh, negative emotion and its nature, so that we can apply what is exactly the state of mind that is mutually incompatible. And if we don't recognize clearly that emotion that will, will apply an antidote, that is not the correct one. So that needs some kind of discernment and fine understanding of the nuances of those afflictive mental state or emotions. And for instance, to give an example, if we think of hatred and anger, uh, hatred is a, as an element of of wanting to harm. Anger could be just like uh, we, we boil all over the place. Not necessarily wish to harm, they might be, but not. So then accordingly, the antidote for hatred will be benevolence, loving kindness, wish to do good, because you cannot in the same instant, in the same thought, toward the same person, wanting to harm and wanting to do good. Just like you cannot stretch your hand and give a blow in one single gesture. So those are mutually incompatible. But anger is not, suppose it's not just malevolent, it's just you start blowing the fuse. The antidote is more like patience in the sense of uh, forbearance, having a vast state of mind that doesn't get carried away immediately. So this little bit of a nuance and of course if the anger turns into a malevolent thought then also loving kindness should come so that's why it's important to recognize all the different aspects and some aspect of anger might be not malevolent at all it might be indignation in the face of injustice a massacre in that case it's just a powerful reaction to the suffering of others that triggers a strong determination to do something about it. So there's nothing afflictive in that. You don't have to be carried away out of control by this anger, of course. Uh, but some people might name that anger, although possibly it's probably uh, clearer to not to use anger in that case, but call it indignation or the powerful determination that this cannot be like that because others are suffering. But but unless we, we, but if we just put everything under the name of anger, hatred, uh, sort of uh, blowing the fuse, or rightful indignation, then we are confused. So that's why if we want to apply antidote, we should really examine the characteristics of those afflictive emotions. Now antidote again is something that is mutually incompatible with that mental toxins. So as I mentioned, uh, the wish to benefit others is incompatible with the wish to harm. And so, whenever there is this kind of little bit of malevolence that might come in our mind the, to the fact that we might consciously wish to harm, then the antidote is to immediately bring the idea that no one wants to, to suffer. The most fundamental right of all human beings is to avoid suffering. And even somebody has committed some wrongdoings, it's more like a mad person. And we should look at that more like a physician uh, trying to treat a mad person rather than someone who wants to enact revenge or harm or destroy, because that's only going to perpetuate the cycle of hate. So applying the antidote of benevolence will dissolve hatred. Likewise, this compulsive craving or desire. Again, here desire in itself is too much of a vague term because desire is just a driving force. It's nothing good or bad if your desire is an aspiration or intention to benefit others, uh, to save the world or to save the environment, then of course that's an essential drive uh, to carry out a noble intention so that what was could be wrong with that 
or there are desires which are in a way ethically neutral not desire for a cup of tea or to take a shower or this is neither especially good or bad in terms of afflict, uh, affecting others in terms of suffering or happiness now if that desire is thirst and craving it might cause suffering to others and it certainly perturbs and afflicts your mind so in that sense it is goes against happiness if it creates a kind of thirst that is constantly tormenting oneself then so from so it has it has it has uh, uh, not, it, uh, it, it has spoiled uh, the initial aspiration for happiness which is a legitimate sort of aspiration or intention and with grasping it's a little bit like uh, the genuine aspiration to be happy that is causes us to desire something uh, if there's no grasping it could be very fine it's like a little bit like the, if you have a crystal glass and you you make like a pinch with the with the finger it has beautiful sound but the moment that grasping and thirst come in is like you put the finger on the rim of the glass and the sound vanishes so the the, the positive quality of that aspiration now is spoiled so design in when it becomes a compulsive thirst and craving is a source of torment so it's not that it is bad morally it's simply that it brings suffering so if you don't want to suffer then why should you uh, want to perpetuate this kind of thirst uh, as uh, Nagarjuna said because it is it it increased the wanting it sort of self uh, perpetuates and it becomes worse and worse so we give different example to that like drinking salty water the more you're drinking the more you're thirsty or like scratching with something that itching of course the more you scratch the more it itches and Nagarjuna said of course it feels a great relief when it's scratching so much and you scratch but isn't it better not to itch at all so that's even more comfortable yes yeah, true so so in that sense that's where we have to need so in a way all those uh, sort of mental state whether it's desire anger from the from the distance you might think it's one thing it's like a, if you look at a wall from distance it looks very smooth but if you look closely there are little bumps and uh, places where it's painted differently it's not uniform and smooth there are nuances in that so if you want to apply antidotes you have to take that in account and also desire is therefore lack of inner freedom because you you are totally stuck with that so the antidote is just not to be pulled by this compulsive aspiration so antidote is sometimes it's called non-attachment but in fact what it means it means inner freedom not to be the slave of, of, of that so for each of those there's, some, there's something like envy envy or jealousy of course there are many aspects but one of them is that we are basically unhappy at others happiness that's most you know each of those have uh, their own personality all those uh, negative emotions the anger is the bad guy desire is the seductive one and jealousy is the stupid one <laughs> you see because what is more stupid to be unhappy at others happiness uh, it doesn't uh, bring you whatever quality they have uh, his honor says often they give the example you envy someone who is very successful and all this and that you lose appetite you lose your sleep that person is fine <laughs> you don't get anything out of that you just make yourself miserable just for absolutely no benefit and so and also if you think about it no one wants to see themselves as as being a bad person who wants the doom for all humanity so basically we consider a good human being is someone who wish others to be happy isn't it a priori why not so now if someone so now if on top of that you get concerned by accomplishing the happiness of others that's even a more noble purpose so suppose you have that in mind 
and someone has managed to accomplish their own happiness already, that's much worse legs to do. So you should be very, very glad that that person is perfectly happy at all those qualities, doesn't need your help. So instead of being jealous, just rejoice. That's why rejoicing wholeheartedly is the antidote for feeling uncomfortable at others' qualities, happiness, achievement, and so forth. And then, uh, of course, the antidote of pride or arrogance is humility. And by what do we mean by humility? Humility doesn't mean that one becomes flat like a carpet. It simply means uh, that we recognize uh, that there's so much we need to learn and to progress. That's, that's exactly the way we can progress and learn. It says that uh, the water of qualities doesn't dwell on the top of the rock of pride. And water always goes down. So uh, water of quality always look at, at the lowest place and then collects there. The another example that is the image that is given in the scriptures it says, look at a fruit tree. A tree without fruits, fruit being the qualities, all the branch sort of goes high up in the sky, very proudly. But when there's a lot of fruits, quality, all the branch goes, you know, sort of bend to the ground. So that's, uh, that humility is a genuine uh, sense of that there's still so much to learn, with there's so much to accomplish on the path. So the humility is not a lack of confidence, it's just recognizing that there's so much to learn and we, there's no need to puff up with the little quality we have. So that's something very uh, remarkable. And uh, um, it's nice always to see someone who has humility. I remember uh, once there was two great scholars who came from Eastern Tibet. They had managed to uh, continue in very remote places their practice and study during the Cultural Revolution. And so they were wonderful uh, teachers and very s simple and, but very learned at the same time. Uh, so they came to Nepal and they were, they, very cl they were very close to my teacher, Kensei Moshe. So I remember one evening, they, when they, after they arrived from Tibet, they were sitting in Kensir Moshe's room, and Kensir Moshe told them, oh, since you are here, it would be wonderful if you could uh, you know, teach uh, to our monks for, you know, while, while you are here for one or two months to our philosophical college. And then one of them, there was two, two of them sitting there, one of them said, oh, Moshe, I cannot do that because I don't know anything, and also he doesn't know anything. So he was taken for granted that, uh, uh, the other one said, was approving, noting that, yes, yes, of course, I don't know anything. <laughs> so he was speaking for both. He was humble for both of them. <laughs> and then, like, uh, I was fortunate enough to sometimes be there when my teacher, Kensei Moshe, would offer teaching to His Holiness. And that was amazing, because they were trying to rival of humility. When Kensei Moshe would arrive uh, at the door of his honest residence, his honest would be waiting outside, and then it's like, you know, just like there was a, a salmon sort of porch, and when Kensei Moshe would come out of the car, and Kensei Moshe would approach, his honest would start doing prostration. And then Kensei Moshe wanted to do prostration to his honest. But since he was older and heavier, he could only do one, and his honest is still very brisk, so he just finished three. <laughs> But the uh, head would touch when they were on the on the on the ground, <laughs> and then he would take Rinpoche by the Kensimushi by the hand and take him inside, and they would sit, uh, two sort of facing each other, and then the whole day, uh, whether some text or some empowerments, Kensimushi would offer to his holiness, and then uh, it was amazing like to see how incredibly humble they would be toward each other. So that was a great lesson. None of them was thinking, you know, oh, I'm the Dalai Lama, or oh, I'm the teacher of the Dalai Lama, you know, <laughs> such a big shot. But they were trying almost to... Uh, so another example, uh, there was 
two of the disciples of Kinsha Moshe were wonderful uh, lamas themselves, and uh, they b they were both extremely humble. They are well known for their humility. So one one of them was saying about the other one. You know, when he is there, he is so humble that it seems that to be more humble, I will have to go underground. <laughs> <laughs> Because he's already so low that I have to go underground to be more humble than him. So that's refreshing when you see that, you know. Uh, instead of people competing, you know, who's going to sit higher, who's going to do this, who's going to do that. And that's the genuine expression of inequalities. You know, they have nothing to win, nothing to lose, everything to give and everything to share. So then what, there's no need to be proud of anything. So that's why uh, it also feels so comforting to be uh, near those great teachers because we don't feel that uh, sort of uh, any kind of pride or arrogance or conceit. And if there is, then it's a bad sign. So, uh, yes. So then, so likewise, we can use different antidotes for each of those. And using antidotes means first applying them when all those afflictive emotions occur, but then cultivating them, to so applying them again and again. And the, 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 the importance of applying them again and again is those negative emotions or destructive or whatever we call them, afflictive emotions, they come because some kind of tendency. Uh, and there is a kind of... Uh, propensity for them to arise more or less uh, depending upon our personal nature and so to apply an antidote once of course is successfully deal with one event but they'll come back because of this propensity so we should not give up and it's only through the repetition of that that will successfully uh, manage to change things it's a little bit like a, a roll of parchment you know, it has been rolled for a very long time so when you unroll it on the table with your two hands flat and when you lift your hand again it rolls again so what you need is to unroll it 100 times so hold it enough so after some time then you stop uh, rolling again so the thing is if we how does this bend of rolling has occurred because each time we let those emotions invade our mind, uh, dominate our mind, and we let them express uh, a blow of anger, or we feel that jealousy for a long time. What happens? First, it's affliction, but also each time it sort of reinforces the tendencies. So the idea that was floated around for a while that we should vent our anger, now we should people at some point we would, we would pay for breaking pianos and stuff like that to make sure that you don't keep anything inside. Well, all the studies, and that's not surprising from a meditator's point of view, have shown that you're just increasing your angry tendencies. You know, you're not, maybe on the moment it's like this nice scratching, but it doesn't help. So once it was described to his holiness, and he said when you're really angry, you know, people sometimes bump their head against the wall, or the person said, or against the pillow. So his holiness didn't miss the point, and he said, I'd rather choose the pillow. <laughs> so th that doesn't work. Now, at the opposite, if you, if you skillfully deal with a particular episode of anger or jealousy or obsession, and applying the antidote, it just dissolve, this, uh, there's two things. First, you su you successfully deal with that particular event, and then as you repeatedly successfully deal with that event, it starts eroding the very tendency. So there's a twofold effect: not falling under the sort of becoming the slave or carried away by that negative emotions. And each time you succeed, it's a little bit less powerful. It comes less often, less strongly, until sort of it may vanish one day. So that's this double effect it has. And that is not, uh, and it, it is neither suppressing it, that means suppressing means to suppress it and leave it as it is. Then it's like a time bomb. 
So that's probably why people say you should vent anger. Because if they don't have any antidote to use, and then it's, it is, well, you could say it's unhealthy or whatever to keep it like that. Because of course it doesn't solve anything to keep a time bomb inside all the time. And if they don't have any means to, uh, to neutralize that, then either they keep it or they blow, and so some choose to blow, some choose to keep, but neither is really healthy. Oh, yeah, so there's only either, either you vent it and explode, or you suppress it and it's not good either. So that's not the solution. Here you dealt successfully, but for the time being it has been neutralized, it has dissolved, it is not left intact. So this, this is the way to use specific antidotes. Now there are we could say more fundamental or universal antidotes because they deal with the very mechanism of becoming entangled with those negative emotions. What do we mean by being entangled with negative emotions? Is when there is a strong afflictive emotion we identify with it. Identify in the sense that it's all over the place. We almost like if I was anger because there's so much anger that you don't distinguish anymore um, your, your basic consciousness and anger is so much all over the place. It's like, it's like looking through uh, red glasses, everything is red or green or yellow. So, but that's not, so, so you identify with it in that sense. But that's not the case. Because you are not the anger, you are not the anxiety, you are not the jealousy. You just uh, fall prey to it. No more that when you have fever, you, you go to doctor and say, Doctor, today I am the cold. I am the fever. You are not the fever. You, you, have, you, are, not the, any, you are not the stomach ache. You just uh, are afflicted by a stomach ache. So what is not the anger? What is not the anxiety? Of course, it's not the I, because I mean, probably this is not the time to, exam to examine that in detail, but if there's no such thing as a self-entity, what is not anger is not the I. What is not anger is basic awareness, is the fundamental nature of consciousness that is not, uh, that is not um, modified by the content. What do we mean by this fundamental nature of awareness? Just on a purely experiential way, instead of being 100% anger or let's say anxiety, if now you start looking at it, there's something, the mind has always the faculty to look at its own condition. It doesn't need a second mind. And then the third mind to look at the two first one and the fourth one, there's no need for that. It's like a flame, a flame uh, lights up everything, but it doesn't need another flame to light itself. It's, it's light is its nature, so it is self-illuminating. So the mind has the faculty to know itself. But when it knows itself, that knowing or awareness of anger is awareness of anger. It's not angry because you are aware of anger. So that part which is aware is aware that's his quality but he's not angry so now instead of being 100 percent anger you have a kind of new space of awareness within your experience and the experience shows that if you maintain that sort of the gaze of awareness placed on anger or anxiety without letting your mind slip to the trigger what caused that of course if everything, if every time you try to deal with that, say someone upset you, your mind goes to the person who upset you, then it's like pushing the trigger again and again. You keep on recycling or rekindling that anger. So that's endless, putting f wood on the fire and wood on the fire and wood on the fire. Let that obnoxious trigger alone. Just gaze as the fire itself, the phenomena of anger itself. If you do so with a gaze of awareness, it's like a fire that you watch without adding fuel on it. So it will burn for a while, but not so long. The flame will soon diminish and the fire will die out. So 
we say that under the gaze of awareness, any afflictive emotion will melt like frost under the morning's rising sun. It just melts away. And here too, you avoid the two pitfalls of venting that or repressing that. It's dealt very intelligently by just letting fade away. So that particular episode has just vanished. It is not left as a time bomb. And similarly, you have also eroded the tendency. So that's a very powerful way that can apply to all, because you can do that with anxiety, you can do that with fear, you can do that with anger, you can do that with obsession. There is, in the beginning, it's still there. Very soon, it starts losing its sort of brilliance, intensity, this compulsive power to upset you. And it's kind of strange, it's still there, but like a sort of pale reflection of what it was, a sort of a powerless anger, a powerless anxiety. And then it's less and less sort of there. And then at some point, it's just gone, and there's just awareness is there, and that's it. So if you repeatedly do so, then uh, that's how we deal with, the, with those episodes. So in order to do that, we need mindfulness. We need to be aware, especially at the moment uh, the, this afflictive emotion begins to arise. If we are distracted and it invades our mind, it's always more difficult. Now, when the forest is in fire, then it requires so many people to intervene. It always began with a spark, and that spark is just need like two, two fingers and it's gone. So, why we let the spark become f a big fire? Because we, we are not mindful. We, didn't, we let those sort of start to grow from underneath without uh, thinking that it's a problem or without being aware that this is something that is going to cause great afflictions. And we let it grow out of proportion and then it's of course more difficult to deal with. But if we have this element of mindfulness, then we can bring immediately the gaze of awareness and then it dissolves. So part of the training is to cultivate that mindfulness that catches those initial steps of the negative emotion. And how is it? It's a little bit based on having recognized their, their destructive effect. Now, if you have again and again experienced, let's say there's a pickpocket and he managed to pick your purse twice or something like that. And then you identify who the person. Now, if that person comes in the room, immediately you recognize that. And then you keep an eye on that person. Because you have recognized that it's a potentially dangerous guy. So, likewise, if you have recognized from past experience that hatred is highly destructive, and then suddenly you see it coming, say, hey, hey that's, I have to be careful. So you deal with that now, not wait that, you pick up your purse, run away, and then you have to ask all the police of the area to find the person. So that means recognizing properly the emotions, applying the other antidote or awareness. And so all those are different methods, but the purpose is the same. Uh, no matter which one it is, there's not one that is more advanced or more precious or more useful. Um, it is just whichever is the best according to our capacities, according to the time, according to circumstances. It's like a key. doesn't matter if it's a golden key or iron key. What you need is the key that opens the door. Or it's like a medicine. If you have a headache, aspirin is the best. You don't have to buy a very expensive antibiotic or something. So I think we should think that the most precious method and the most precious teaching is the one that works for us at the where we are on the path with the capacity that we have now. And then as things progress, and then different tools would be useful. So that's explained also that the multiplicity of the tools, the different levels sometimes of the path, there are even moments where we can almost use and play with those strong emotions 
in order to further our understanding. Just to give one example, like anger, when it begins, it's, you know, we are sitting quietly here and someone, you know, shout at us and, you know, and we wake up. If you think of it, the very first moment, there's elements of brilliance. You, are w you were sort of wake up and someone told you you are such a thief and suddenly your mind becomes very clear. Now imagine that you could catch that clarity and stay with it, not go further. That's sort of nice. You have a clear mind. But of course, not easy because usually it goes immediately to the next step. So you could imagine that there would be a way, if you are very even more skillful and more aware, to just use that without letting the unwanted consequences to come. So in that sense, it could be useful to further your understanding. But it's a bit risky because it goes so fast to the negative side. So that's why it says it's like trying to take a jewel on top of a. Uh, snake's head. You have to be real fast. <laughs> <laughs> so when do we supposed to make a break? Ten past eleven. Ten past. So it's past. <laughs> <laughs> so we are five minutes late for the break. So we can make a little break. Thank you.